Let me thank you all for uh, coming today to honor Charles Plosser uh, and to be here with the Global Interdependence Center. Today is a very special day for us because we're rolling out our new look. We have a new website which we'll uh, show you a picture of and invite you to go there and of course read our Declaration of Interdependence uh, <coughs> from the website and it'll, it'll pop up here. Pretty fancy. I like that. We're, we're going to click through it here, uh, but we invite you to click through it and see what's going on. Now, we've got a list of programs that we're undertaking in your program for today. If you want to learn more about those and join us, like, you know, in dull places like Paris, or um, feel free to click onto the website, find out the details, look at the fantastic program of speakers that we've lined up for you, and uh, then register right online. So we'd like you to do that. The other thing we've done is to uh, build a new promotional video, and uh, we have just a short clip from that that we'd like to share with you right now, if we can get that started. They're going to start Hello, again. I'm Mary Caracoli, a financial journalist and a member of the board of directors at the Global Interdependence Center. In 1776, Philadelphia was the center of an independence movement. The representatives of 13 colonies met at Independence Hall to declare their autonomy from Great Britain. Self-rule, self-determination, self-sufficiency were the watchwords of a revolution. 200 years later, as America celebrated its bicentennial, Philadelphia found itself at the center of another movement. This movement was all about interdependence. The principles of this declaration were all about cooperation and collaboration among the nations of the world. This is the story of the Global Interdependence Center of Philadelphia and its arrival as a thought leader of global significance. When top officials of the United Nations and the United States met in Philadelphia in 1976, they roundly endorsed a declaration of interdependence. We declare interdependence with the people of all nations, they said, calling on others to join them in embracing the principles and building the institutions that would enable mankind to survive and civilization to flourish. Their declaration launched the Global Interdependence Center, which is today guided by its mission to encourage the expansion of global dialogue and free trade in order to improve living standards worldwide. GIC serves as a neutral forum regarding financial markets, the future of financial product innovation, monetary policy, and the role of central banks and governments. And when emerging issues change the way we view the world, GIC assembles experts to respond. Recent events have addressed September 11th and subsequent terrorist attacks, health emergencies such as the avian flu and SARS, and economic turmoil such as the European debt crisis. Paul McCulley, a global investment banker, is the principal driver behind GIC's newest initiative, a $1 million endowment supporting the Global Society of Fellows. Members of the Society will serve as ambassadors, representing the citizens of the world as they convene public and private conversations with political leaders worldwide. Everybody knows about Philadelphia's Independence Hall, but this city just may have an interdependence mall, also known as the Benjamin Franklin Parkway sometimes referred to as a piece of Paris in Philadelphia. This majestic boulevard is lined with the flags of countries from around the world. And it is from this wonderful international city that GIC reaches across the country and around the globe to promote dialogue, cooperation, and free trade. The Global Interdependence Center already has established an enduring legacy. May its efforts, its membership, and its influence continue to grow in the decades to come. Nice job, Mary. And in case you don't recognize him, that really is <laughs> Paul McCauley down here, but he's, his hair is a little bit longer than in that photo. But thank you, Paul, for making this newest initiative possible. We really appreciate it. Okay, according to my schedule here, I'm not sure what my boss is telling me. My, 
my boss, Sharon Javi, my wife, who <laughs> is, is kind of making all these things happen these days. I assume we're going to stop now for 15 minutes and eat. I was right. Anyway, so I'll be back in 15 or 20 minutes, and we'll continue with the program. <laughs> Thank you all very much. <laughs> all right, ladies and gentlemen, if I might uh, interrupt your dessert now. First, I'll remind you to turn off all of your electronic equipment. So, David, you can keep the pacemaker on. Now, he's a week younger than I am, and he never lets me forget it. So, <clears throat> so thank you all for coming. I would like to, uh, again, thank our staff, Sharon, who's kind of staff, super staff, and, uh, and Jill and Kimberly. They did a great job putting everything together. Thank you all very much. So let me talk about the global, uh, yeah. There it is up there, the Global Citizen Award. To give you a little history on it, we, we started giving the Global Citizen Award to honor people who, uh, in their personal lives and their professional lives, uh, really pursued the ideals that are expressed in our Declaration of Interdependence. And again, I invite you to come to the new website and read the Declaration. Um, and also who have uh, supported GIC in our pursuit of the ideals of that mission. Uh, the Federal Reserve has been uh, a longtime partner of ours, and uh, Charlie Plasser has uh, certainly done a great job of carrying on that tradition. Uh, the support of the Fed uh, in our pr domestic program as well as our foreign programs uh, has been exceptional. So I'm going to invite my colleague, David Kotak, uh, who's our vice chair and program chair, who invents all these wonderful foreign trips that we have to come up uh, with me. Uh, and we can present the Global Citizen Award to Charles Plasser. So you want, want you have a few words, and then yeah, then we'll do those. Yeah. So you want to do this first? Yeah. Well, well let me read this first. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, let me read a letter, which captures a great deal of uh, our feelings about Charlie. Charles Plasser is a good friend, and one of the most senior economists who is a member of a decision-making body of a central bank. He has enjoyed an outstanding academic career with a long track record of extremely good and interesting publications in a large number of refereed, top-rated academic journals. His familiarity with econometric techniques and their fruitful application to economic policy issues is one of the trademarks of Charles' research. His focus on economic data and his ability to assess the state of the economy and the best way to use monetary policy to ensure sustainable economic development consistent with low and stable inflation are the trademarks of his monetary policy views. I am familiar with Charles' academic work and his monetary policy views for many years. I hold both in great esteem. I cannot think of a better choice than Charles Plosser for the GIC Global Citizen Award, and I congratulate him and GIC for his choice, for this choice. Axel Weber, University of Chicago Booth. Charles? Well, Charles, let me embarrass you a little bit more from one of your uh, colleagues, past colleagues, and, and the recipient of this award. Uh, <clears throat> let me read this uh, from Bill Poole. Since I count Charles Plosser as a professional friend from the early 70s and increasingly a personal friend as well, professional friend that was, he richly deserves being named a GIC Global Citizen. The financial crisis was a I'm skipping a lot because it's a long letter. Uh, we'll give it to him. The financial crisis was a consequence of the failure of firms and the federal government to manage risk correctly, in good part because their focus was excessively on the short run. Uh, <clears throat> it says, Charlie's current work reflects his effort to prevent monetary policy from also falling into the trap of short-termism. That's a new word I guess we have. It behooves all of us to listen to Charles Plosser. Charlie, I congratulate you on this award. And then finally, and you can read with me on the first page uh, of your program from 
Ben Bernanke, who is chairman of the Fed. Dear Charlie, please accept my best wishes and sincere congratulations on being named the recipient of the Global Interdependence Center's 2011 Global Citizen Award. The forces shaping globalization are significantly influenced by the exchange of creative and divergent perspectives. This honor recognizes your valuable contribution to the dialogue and your dedication to bringing about a new and more positive era in global relations. Congratulations on this achievement, Ben. All right, let's put you in the middle here so All we right. can. Okay. Get rid of those. It's, heavy. <laughs> it's not right. gold plated. Charlie, the dais is yours. Great. Duncan, David, thank you so much. Uh, this is uh, quite flattering, and I'm quite honored to be here today, and quite honored to have so many friends of the GIC to turn out. Um, uh, I am deeply honored to be this year's recipient of the GIC Global Citizen Award. You know, for the past five years since I came to Philadelphia, I've had the pleasure of observing and participating with the GIC in its efforts to foster an international dialogue on economic matters of global importance. I've been very impressed with the breadth and the reach of these programs that the center has put together over the years. The GIC's effort to promote such a dialogue have been especially timely in a world economy continues to wrestle with the consequences of a financial crisis and a severe global recession. The GIC's convening of central bankers, policymakers, business leaders from different nations and different industries has created opportunities to leverage knowledge and experiences in these very challenging times. Yet I believe even as the world economy recovers, we all have learned that our economies are increasingly intertwined. And therefore, I believe these efforts by the GIC will remain relevant and important for many years to come. You know, when I was trying to think about what to talk about today, I was reminded by something my wife Janet said to me a long time ago when I was giving such a speech. She said, um, I asked her, I said, well, you know, I'm having trouble deciding what to talk about. Should I be charming or witty or humorous or just what should I be? She says, oh, no, 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 just be yourself. <laughs> well, <laughs> So ever since then, I've kind of taken that lesson hard. I just be myself. So that's what you're going to get today. <laughs> um, in the past few years, the global financial crisis has led central bankers around the world into uncharted territory. As extraordinary disruptions in financial markets have led them to take extraordinary actions. However necessary these actions may have been, unusual and unexpected policy choices do shape the views of the public and their expectations about future policy, even if policymakers do not intend to do so. This is especially true when policymakers take unusually or highly discretionary policy actions without communicating a clear framework for those actions. For example, the rescue of Bear Stearns creditors in March of 2008 led many investors to expect their other investment banks would receive similar treatment should they run into trouble, even though no such promise was made or even intended. This belief probably encouraged investors and firms to take some, some more risks, perhaps excessive risks in some cases, um, that they might not otherwise have taken in the anticipation that they too would be rescued in the event of trouble. This likely led to unexpected losses when the failure of Lehman Brothers, uh, with the failure of Lehman Brothers in September of 2008, adding to the turmoil in markets. Thus, taking highly discretionary policy actions without communicating to the public the implications of those actions for the future conduct of policy can be both problematic and destabilizing. More generally, economic research over the last 30 years has shown that setting monetary policy in a systematic, or rule-like manner leads to better economic outcomes, lower and less volatile inflation, and, lower and more stable economic and employment. As I've discussed on many occasions, there is value in conducting policy in a systematic manner in both good times and in bad times. Systematic policy helps the public and markets better understand 
how policy will be conducted in the future, and thus it enables them to make better decisions today. But the benefit depends on the public's understanding of the policy-making framework. And that requires a level of commitment, a level of credibility, and effective communication by the central bank. So today what I'd like to do is step back and discuss some specific ways that I think we can strengthen the framework of U.S. monetary policy through enhanced commitment, credibility, and communication. And in doing so, improve economic stability. Now, of course, this is well known. These are my views. Do not necessarily reflect those of the Federal Reserve Board or my colleagues on the Open Market Committee. And some of them are delighted that I can say that. <laughs> it's true, nonetheless. Um, so in order to discuss the framework for achieving our policy goals, we need to have a clear understanding of what those goals, in fact, are. Congress set the goals of monetary policy in a 1977 amendment to the Federal Reserve Act, which was reaffirmed in 2000. This mandate requires the Federal Reserve to conduct monetary policy, and I quote, to promote effectively the goals of maximum employment, stable prices, and moderate long-term interest rates. Now, there are many people who believe that these goals are in conflict with one another, but in fact, my view is that they are in fact complementary. Economists have come to understand that achieving price stability is one of the most effective ways for monetary policy to contribute to our other two goals. Price stability contributes to the economy's growth and employment prospects in the longer term and helps to moderate variability of output and employment in the short to medium term. Price stability allows the economy to function in a more efficient and more productive manner by giving individuals and businesses more confidence that the purchasing power of the dollar will not erode. Failing to, main, failing to maintain price stability can often therefore lead to more instability not, and lower output and employment. One way to see this is to recognize that if inflation rises to unacceptable levels, as it did in the 1970s, monetary policy may be forced to restore price stability. That, in turn, can lead to an increase in unemployment, as it did in the recessions of the early 80s. Thus, increases in inflation in the near term risk creating unemployment in the future. As a result, we end up with less stability, not more. Price stability also helps to foster financial stability and moderate long-term interest rates by minimizing the inflation premium that investors demand to hold long-term assets. Because moderate long-term interest rates followed so directly from our price stability mandate, many people have come to refer to the Fed as having a dual mandate, price stability and maximum employment. But I'd like to remind you that price stability and the employment goals are materially different in their nature. The most significant difference is that the level of prices, and thus inflation, is in fact a monetary phenomenon. And over the intermediate to longer term, so the inflation rate can be chosen and controlled through monetary policy. The same cannot be said for the goal of maximum employment, or the unemployment rate for that matter. These are largely determined by factors that are beyond the direct control of monetary policy. In the long run, maximum employment depends on such things as demographics, taxes and regulations, labor productivity and skills, unemployment benefits, minimum wage laws, and a host of other factors um, that go into determining the maximum employment rate. This means that the maximum employment will fluctuate over time as many of these factors change over time. Monetary policy cannot and should not be used to offset these longer run changes in the maximum level of employment. Even in the near term, the modern approach to macroeconomics suggests that employment will fluctuate with the forces that affect supply and demand, such as oil shocks, earthquakes, or decisions by households to save more or deleverage, perhaps due to a fall in the stock market or a fall in house prices. In that framework, it's neither desirable nor even efficient for monetary policy to, to try and prevent market forces from making the necessary adjustments to such disturbances, even if they have consequences 
for employment or production. Instead, monetary policy should be set in a way that allows the economy to efficiently use its resources given the economic disturbances it has experienced. It allows for the best economic outcomes given the environment. Because monetary policy can deliver price stability, I and many other economists believe that it makes sense for the central bank to be clear in setting a numerical objective for medium-term inflation. But because, unemployment, because employment is affected by so many other factors, both in the short run and the long run, it does not make sense or even feasible for the Fed to set explicit numerical objectives for employment or unemployment. By creating an environment of low and stable inflation, monetary policy will make a valuable contribution to maximum employment in both the short run and the long run. Moreover, a credible commitment to price stability helps anchor inflation expectations, improves Federal Reserve credibility, and affords the central bank with the flexibility to adjust monetary policy to support output and employment adjustments in the short run in the face of economic disturbances. Now that framework of thinking about price stability and employment is what modern textbooks view as the standard framework for conducting monetary policy. It's commonly referred to as flexible inflation targeting. This approach combines a credible commitment to a medium-term inflation objective, which in turn allows monetary policy to adjust to economic shocks in a manner that helps promote the return of output and employment to more desirable values without undermining inflation expectations. Its emphasis, it emphasizes clear, transparent communications to the public about the policymakers' views of the current economic conditions, the economic outlook, and its decision-making framework. Flexible inflation targeting is widely practiced by major central banks around the world. While the details often differ, key themes include a commitment to an, ex an explicit medium-term inflation objective, transparent communication about the outlook, the policy process, and how policy decisions relate to the changes in economic conditions. It's important to recognize that by being more explicit about its objectives and more transparent about its systematic uh, approach to decision making, the central bank enhances its credibility. Perhaps just if not more as important is it also increases its accountability to the public. It's very harder, it's harder to make commitments that you will be unable or unwilling to keep if the, you know the public can, tell, can take you to task for failing to meet those commitments. The Federal Reserve has not explicitly adopted a flexible inflation targeting framework. Indeed, monetary policy making in the U.S. has historically been conducted on a highly discretionary basis, and the Fed has resisted adopting a specific framework or numerical objectives. Yet over the past two decades or so, Fed policymakers have gradually taken steps toward the more mainstream approach to flexible inflation targeting. Indeed, the Fed, especially under Chairman Bernanke, has become increasingly transparent and has worked to improve its communications with the public and the markets. It has recognized and stressed the importance of keeping expectations of inflation well anchored, and it has become more transparent regarding the committee's economic outlook over both the short run and the intermediate term through its publications on a quarterly basis of what we call the Summary of Economic Projections, or SEP for short, which is published four times a year. All of these efforts, in my view, move us closer to having a monetary policy framework. Of course, such a framework does not solve all of our difficult policy choices. A good deal of judgment still needs to be used in setting appropriate monetary policy. Still, have an explicit framework that you can articulate within which to consider our policy choices in a systematic way would improve monetary policy's effectiveness in meeting our dual mandate while increasing both transparency and accountability. Yet I believe there's more that the Fed could do and should do to further and strengthen its approach to policymaking. 
The minutes of the September FOMC meeting, for example, indicated that most participants favor taking steps to further increase the transparency of monetary policy. This includes providing more information about our longer term policy objectives and factors that influence our policy decisions. So what I'd like to offer you is three of these steps that I think we should take uh, to make our monetary policy framework clearer. First, as no doubt is obvious, let's clarify and make explicit our inflation objective. The effectiveness of monetary policy in achieving its dual mandate is enhanced if the public understands and finds credible the Fed's inflation objective. The FOMC's inflation mandate up to, not, to now is, has been interpreted as being a 2% or a bit less. This interpretation arises from the quarterly SEPs, those projections that I was referring to earlier, in which the majority of participants have said that, and I quote, under appropriate policy, unquote, 2% is their longer run forecast of inflation. I see no reason to mince words. I see no reason for the FOMC not to simply make an explicit, make it explicit that its longer term inflation objective is 2%. We might as well just say it. Making such a clear and explicit statement should give the public confidence that the Fed's commitment to its price stability mandate is a credible one. Being explicit about our inflation objective is fully consistent with the Fed's statutory dual mandate. Given that dual mandate, the structure of the economy, and the magnitude and frequency of shocks that typically hit our economy, I would anticipate that inflation, should it deviate from its objective in the short term, could be brought back towards its objective of 2% within two to three years. But the timing of that adjustment would depend on the size and nature of the shocks to the economy. For example, monetary policy making would have to decide how quickly to move the inflation objective. The FOMC would always take into account implications for near-term economic and financial stability and, probably, and would continue to appropriately use its judgment in setting a policy to promote fully its dual mandate. Being explicit about our inflation objective would help anchor expectations and reduce uncertainty about future policy steps. Also, stabilizing inflation expectations and increasing the credibility of the central bank to remain uh, to, to maintain stable prices can actually affect the inflation process itself. In particular, inflation will become less responsive or sensitive to short-run supply and demand disturbances. That means less volatility in monetary policy and less volatility in output and employment. Second, let's provide more information about the expected policy path. Many central banks that set explicit inflation targets also provide information about the expected path of policy. And of course, in the Fed's case, that's the federal funds rate most normally. For example, Norway, Sweden, New Zealand all do so, although each have their own particular ways of doing it. The Fed also has at times provided information about the expected path of policy, albeit in my view in less effective ways. The Fed has used phrases like extended period. Or in the Greenspan era, some of you may remember the committee talked about moving policy at a, quote, measured pace. More recently, the committee indicated that rates would likely to be kept low until mid-2013. These are examples that illustrate ways of communicating what bankers call, central bankers call forward guidance. Yet such approaches are not very satisfactory in my view. Extended period is vague, can be interpreted differently by different, by different committee members or by market participants. I believe that economic policy, that monetary policy should always be a function of the state of the economy rather than some vague extended period, or for that matter, some specific calendar date. Indeed, one of the reasons I dissented from the policy decision in August was over the use of the mid-2013 language. I was concerned that this would be misinterpreted by the markets as suggesting that monetary policy was no longer contingent on how the economy evolved, 
And in my view, it was the wrong way to go about communicating forward guidance. I think there are better ways. The Summary of Economic Projections, or the SEP, provides a better and more natural way of conveying the committee's sense of future path of policy. Currently, these, the SEP indicates individual forecasts, individual policymakers' forecasts of key economic variables, including output, inflation, unemployment, and it's conditional on each policymaker's assessment of appropriate policy. I think a more appropriate and meaningful way for the committee to convey its sense of forward guidance would to be report that information about committee members' views of appropriate policy and when we report out on the SEP. The information would provide a useful picture of the range of views of future policy as envisioned by committee members and policymakers. These views would not constitute a commitment to follow a particular path of policy, but it would be a current view of where policy was headed. But it would, these views would change, however, over time as economic conditions change. From one meeting to the next as the economic environment change, committee members' views of the path of policy may also evolve, and that would be informative. This would use, add a useful signal to the markets as to the thinking of the committee on an ongoing basis. Third step I'd like to see taken is that we should be more explicit about the committee's reaction function. Policymakers can promote greater economic stability if the public is better able to predict future policy actions. But of course, policymakers don't know what's going to happen in the future with any great certainty or how economic conditions will evolve over time. And so they cannot say for sure what policy will be in the future. But policymakers can provide information on what factors will in fact influence those decisions. I've long argued about, for, about that we would be better off having a more rule-like or more systematic approach to policy making. This means making policy decisions during available economic inf using available economic in information in a consistent and predictable manner. Like I said, we don't know what the future holds, but we can be more systematic about explaining how we use economic data in formulating policy. Currently, the FOMC looks at a variety of information in formulating policy including several versions of monetary rules that have been proposed. We are some ways from choosing one rule or reaction function to describe or guide policy. Yet what research has found is that some simple rules perform remarkably well in a variety of models. These rules usually, usually have policy responding aggressively to deviations of inflation from its target, and of course you have to have a target in order to respond to deviations from a target, also, and also responding to deviations of output from some concept of potential output. The third element of these rules usually is that they tend to involve some smoothing of the policy rate over time rather than resulting in very sharp swings in the policy rate. The practice of looking at a variety of rules or reaction functions and what they tell us about appropriate policy imposes an important discipline on policymaking. We've made some progress. In November of 2009, after much discussion, the committee indicated in its statement that we were conditioning policy decisions on measures of inflation, inflation expectations, and resource utilization. That was a good step, but we should go further. In addition to describing the set of conditioning variables that we consider important as we formulate policy, we should then follow up and communicate our policy decisions in terms of the changes or movements in those underlying variables that we articulate. If the Fed chooses a consistent set of variables and sticks to them, the public would begin to better understand our reaction function, and thus have greater ability to form judgments about the likely path of future policy. This approach would make uncertainty about policy action, would reduce uncertainty about our policy actions and I think promotes stability. Now I spent some time discussing how I would strengthen our monetary policy framework by completing um, a move toward flexible inflation targeting. 
However, given the current state of the economy, there have been some public discussion of the perceived benefit of having the Fed aim for a higher inflation rate, in some cases much higher than 2%. Some have argued that since unemployment rate is higher than anyone would like to see it, and since the federal funds rate is stuck at the zero bound, we should target a higher inflation as a means of reducing unemployment. Others have suggested higher inflation could inflate away the debt overhang in our economy. Now sometimes these arguments um, are opportunistically couched in terms of alternative policy making frameworks such as nominal GDP targeting or price level targeting. But regardless of the name it goes by, I believe the, va the, the motivation that many have is simply to create more inflation. By increasing inflation, some argue that we could lower the real rate of interest and increase monetary accommodation for as long as it takes to bring about an unemployment decline and by a substantial amount. At that point, the goal would be to return inflation to its lower level, more stable level, um, uh, after, the, after the economy had recovered. But for this strategy to work, the public must have complete confidence that the Fed will be able to and willing to bring down inflation in the future. If that confidence wanes and inflation expectations begin to drift up, this strategy will fail. And the consequences could easily be a repeat of the 1970s when monetary policymakers' effort to target a lower unemployment rate allowed inflation to drift steadily higher. The outcome was a steady rise in inflation with no commensurate fall in unemployment. In my mind, to pursue such a strategy would be very risky. The effort to try to chase the employment rate in the 1970s through tolerating higher inflation ultimately failed leading to a severe recession and even higher unemployment rates in the early 1980s as policy worked to sort of reverse the rise of inflation. This is a clear example in which price stability and employment are in fact complementary to each other. Others argue we should strive for a higher rate of expected inflation as a means to drive down short-term interest rates and long-term interest, real interest rates. Moreover, a higher rate of inflation will begin the process of inflating away the many bad debts that people think are holding back economic recovery. Here too, I'm very skeptical of this strategy. In the aftermath of the financial crisis and the severe recession, some people and businesses do indeed face losses, including the many mortgages that remain underwater. However, in my view, using inflation to assign winners and losers associated with these bad debts is poor monetary policy. It's probably poor fiscal policy too. And it would undoubtedly, in my mind, mix monetary and fiscal policy in a way that would undermine the independence of the central bank and its ability to ultimately maintain price stability and support the economy. In summary, over the last couple of decades, the Fed has taken steps toward a flexible inflation targeting framework for monetary policy decisions. They aim to achieve our statutory ma dual mandate of long-run price stability and maximum employment. The Fed has stressed the importance of keeping expectations of inflation well anchored and strive to improve its communications with the public and the markets about the monetary policy making decision-making process. I think it's time for the Fed to explicitly adopt a flexible inflation targeting framework and in doing so take three steps to strengthen the, our approach to policy making. First, clarify and make explicit our long-run inflation objective as 2% in year-over-year -year PCE inflation. Second, publish information about the individual FOMC's assess participants' assessments of appropriate policy that underlie their economic projections. Third, provide information on the FOMC's reaction function, that is, communicate policy decision in terms of changes in the economic conditions that the FOMC is using to formulate policy. By helping the public better understand policy making process, better anticipate policy changes, these three steps can make monetary policy more effective in promoting economic stability in accordance with our dual mandate. Thank you very much.
Charles, thank you for a very poignant and informative presentation. President Plosser has agreed to take questions. Uh, you, I'll let him manage the uh, question taking unless it gets out of hand. Excuse me. Kevin uh, Muring from SGH Macro Advisors. I really liked your three uh, uh, points that you made. Uh, it seems like there's a, which should be a fairly solid consensus within the FMC on that. Uh, going forward, do you th how realistic is it, do you think, that we could have that sort of forward policy guidance, including articulating or publishing the uh, optimal policy path, uh, you know, by next year or something, <laughs> quickly enough that <laughs> Uh, but soon enough to have an impact, and two, is it conceivable that forward policy guidance, if it's being accepted by the public, could be used instead of actual quantitative easing or uh, balance sheet expansion, et cetera? Could it be an alternative? Well, it's, uh, um, I've learned not to predict what the committee is going to do always, because I'm not always a good forecaster in that regard at times, but I would say the following. I think that um, I believe this would be an important step. Uh, I think it is the appropriate way for the committee to express views about forward guidance. Uh, and as part of what I think is good, commu good communication, I think trying to treat forward guidance and communication as kind of these one-off things where we put in a calendar date this time and we take it away next time and we do other things is a poor substitute for a more systematic way of conveying forward guidance. Um, and I do think that, to some, to some degree, that good communications and forward guidance can help, and a commitment to price stability, actually, can help uh, avoiding other steps that are outside the framework, for example. Um, uh, let me go back to last fall, 2010, under QE2. One of, the, one of the most cogent rationales for QE2 last year was the fear of deflation. That there was worry by many people that we were headed into a, 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 a disinflationary period that actually may result in deflation. Um, my forecast wasn't that, but that was a certainly a legitimate concern that many people had. Um, now, the value of having the inflation target is it's a public commitment that you weren't going to let that happen. But at the same time, it became necessary because that commitment wasn't as strong as it might otherwise be, been, and we couldn't communicate the future path of policy of what we thought policy was going to be. Using QE2 was a substitute for convincing the public and sending the messages that we're willing to print enough money or to move to expand our balance sheet to ensure that this is going to happen. So are they perfect substitutes? Not quite but they can lessen the need for some of, the, some of these actions, depending on what you think was, was driving it. So that's kind of a roundabout answer. All right. Nope. Well, who's got a question? Nope. Oh, somebody's one. got a question over there. I'm oh, sorry, I was going. Okay. Hi, I'm Brad Daniels with Fox Asset Management. I was wondering how you measure inflation expectations and uh, also what are the key uh, macro variables that you look at when you make your uh, forecasts? Okay, fair enough question. I think, uh, unfortunately, the, the measures of expecta inflation expectations, there's no one single measure. There are different there are surveys, there are people who look at the difference between nominal treasuries and tips as a way to get what they call inflation break evens. Uh, those are ways that people look at. All, all, all ways of looking at inflation expectations have their own set of flaws associated with them, um, and none of them are perfect. So it really will be a process of, it's a process of judgment of looking at them collectively to get some sense of how they're moving and what they're doing. Uh, I do think that it's important that we look at such things as, as I said, inflation, actual inflation, inflation expectations, and resource utilization in some form, whether you want to call that an, an output gap or you want to call it an unemployment gap or some measure like that. I think the other thing that's come to the forefront, certainly during the crisis, that I, would, I, that I think is important is looking at financial stability. Clearly one of the important things for the Fed to be worried about in these times of financial volatility is, is financial stability. And we have to think hard about um, what our concerns are about financial stability and how, and how we react to instability, if you will. 
So those are the things that I would focus on, and there are different, there are different metrics that you could look at that you could pick within that subset. Um, but those, I think, are the things that are most important. And we ought to be able, after a policy-making decision, at the end of the meeting, describe our policy action in terms of what happens, what our assessment is of these variables. And if we could do that on a sort of repeated basis, the public and markets would learn what we're reacting to and how we're going to be reacting. It's not mechanistic. There'll still be lots of judgments. This will not resolve all the debates within the FOMC about monetary policy. But it would set it in a framework that what I believe would be allow more effective both communications <laughs> and transparency into what our decision-making process would be. Did you have a question? Jeremy? If our economy turns down again, and, and particularly if inflation turns down and the threat of deflation returns, um, what you think the most appropriate monetary policy might be? Uh, in particular, uh, I was a little surprised and disappointed that in the minutes of the last meeting that the FOMC seemed to dismiss uh, the reduction of interest rates on reserves uh, as an effective policy measure, or they sent it back saying it warranted more study, which puzzled me because there had been zero interest for 80 years, so they had a lot of time to, to study that. Um, but uh, I guess I'm asking you whether you think that that might be an appropriate policy or what would be taken if deflation threatens again. Okay, so I, uh, we've had this discussion before, Jeremy, so <laughs> we, we can have it again. All right, so. Uh, I certainly think it's true Thank you. if you take my arguments that I gave in, in my talk and talk about the commitment to an, an inflation objective, we need to protect that objective both when inflation is too high but also at the risk of inflation being too low. And that would clearly be a concern of mine if I thought that um, inflation expectations were precipitously falling, the fear of deflation would not be a healthy thing for the economy, and then it's appropriate for the, for the central bank to react to that. Uh, as I explained before, um, if, you're, if you're not credible about your commitment to an objective, then you may have to result to other tools if the public learn, uh, begins to lose confidence in your ability to protect that objective. So, um, so I think the first step, I think to protect us against that would clearly be announcing what our objective is and saying we're committed to achieving it. That would be the first step. The second step is, would be occasionally you may have to take actions to support that, to convince the public that that commitment is real and that you're willing to actually respond to that. Last year, QE2 was an example of how we made that commitment more credible by taking a step to engage and prevent inflationary expectations from falling. I viewed that was, that was appropriate. Um, I think if we had more uh, credibility, such steps may not be necessary, but in the current environment it may be that we have to back that up with actions and certainly, certainly buying assets would be one way, not the only way, one way to signal our commitment that we don't want inflation to fall any more than we want it to rise. So that, that would be a possibility. I think the other possibility that might generate uh, sort of aggressive action on the, on the part of the Fed is clearly another financial crisis of some kind. People talk a lot about what's going on in Europe and how that may play out and its consequences for the U.S. financial system. Um, certainly the Fed, as a lender of last resort, it's important that we play a role in um, reacting to those sorts of events and ensuring that the payment systems and the financial systems remain stable to the degree that we can. So that would, that would probably call for some sort of action, but it would depend on the nature of the shock and how it was playing out, which we really don't know at this point. Um, uh, so uh, I think, yes, it, it would call for actions, but I think we, could, we would strengthen the case for not having to act if we had a stronger commitment and more credibility to that commitment. And there was a second part to your question that I... Oh, interest on reserves, yes. So I actually, I have some sympathy for the notion of interest on reserves. Uh, that's a very traditional monetary policy tool. I have, uh, I have a lot of sympathy for using that as an instrument of some kind. But I think that there's lots of concerns in the financial community and in the Fed about what that might do to um, uh, short-term markets and their functioning. 
And particularly what's unusual is that, yes, you're right, we did have um, zero interest on reserves for most of our history. That's not a, that in and of itself isn't the problem. But we've also never had zero interest on reserves when we had a trillion and a half dollars of excess reserves sitting in the financial, in the banking system either. So there's some concerns about well, how, that will work, how those two things will interact with each other. There are other concerns that in a period where you're already bound by the zero bound on interest rates and you've got repo rates and interest rates already close to zero, the implications for the treasury market and auctions, which legally can't have negative interest rates in the treasury auctions, or repo rates going into negative territory. I think there are people, I think are legitimately unsure as to sort of what the consequences, if you might say for the plumbing, <laughs> of our short-term funding markets might be for this. Um, certainly, it's still on my list of things that would be possible, but it would be risky because we've never been in this environment. We don't quite fully understand all the ramifications and perhaps unintended consequences it might engender. But So that's kind of the way I, I feel about it. Some people are very much opposed to it. I'm kind of more open, but I think it might be a risky strategy in that, in that sense. And we certainly don't want to um, further impair or um, muck up the plumbing, if you will, of our short-term money markets, uh, they're too critical to, to our ongoing funding issues. So I, I'm a little skeptical, but I'm open to discussions of that. Paul? Paul, you get the last question. Paul, Paul. good friend, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> Charlie. Paul McCulley of the GIC. First, I want to say thank you, uh, President Plosser, for being here and honoring us by accepting this honor and congratulations. It's an absolute delight to have you here. Thank you very much. Um, very powerful speech, uh, articulating a framework for policy making that's near and dear to my heart that before you can make a decision, you have to have a framework for making a decision. Whether you and I agree or disagree, it's nice to hear you robustly lay out your framework, which leads me to a two-part or well, actually, it's one question with two parts. In line with your framework, you didn't mention Hyman Minsky's financial instability hypothesis at all, though you did comment that financial stability is important to you as part of your framework. So the first part of my question is, how would you work in High's financial instability hypothesis into your framework? And number two, and related, how would your framework adjust if you were to conclude decisively that we're in a liquidity trap. All right, part one, financial stability is important. It's part of our, it's something that I think the Fed takes very seriously. I'm going to simplify, rather than going straight to Hyman Minsky's thing, I'm going to simplify a little bit and, I th and, and say that I think that the Fed's responsibility ultimately, and the central banks in general, is that we're lenders of last resort. Walter Badgett gave us the clue to this 150 years ago, 140 years ago, when he said what central banks need to do in a crisis, in a liquidity crisis, in a financial crisis, is l lend freely at a penalty rate against good collateral. <laughs> All right? um, I think central banks' appropriate response in those types of crises is to provide sufficient liquidity so that you don't have a liquidity crisis in that, in that context. Now, that's easier said than done. I'm perfectly... <laughs> um, Sometimes it's hard to distinguish liquidity from insolvency, um, and uh, and so it makes it's not an easy uh, message or it's not an easy framework to actually implement. But conceptually, it's the right framework. And as far as I'm concerned, about the appropriate role of central banks. Um, uh, so I'll just put that aside for, from that standpoint. But uh, on the on on the liquidity trap, I think the issue is the real question is it if. It depends on what else is going on. I think one of the things that I've learned and I, modern macroeconomics has taught us about is that corporate re policy responses depend on the nature of the shocks that are affecting the system. So that against some kind of shocks, certain types of actions are appropriate. Against other types of disturbances, different policy reactions are appropriate. And so you've got to make, a, uh, uh, make an assessment, if you will, at the end of the day, What's the problem? What's the shock? Before you design the appropriate policy response. So I think the liquidity trap argument is basically one, I'm going to translate it as that we're stuck at the zero bound. <laughs> okay? And the question, the question one has to ask at that point is whether or not expansive monetary policy will affect the real economy at all in that framework. And if so, how might you do it? Well, one of the things that we've, we've learned is that 
if you really believe that you can't get interest rates negative enough, <laughs> then one argument for that is quantitative easing arguments or creating a lot of inflation. The question is, do you really think that's the, that's the magic tool? Is it just a liquidity trap of that, or is there something else going on in the economy? I would remind people that um, uh, I was reading something this morning and someone saying, you know, if the Fed would just act, they can't stay on the sidelines. And I, I said to myself, wait a minute, we've reduced the interest rate from five and a quarter to zero. We've kept it at zero for three years. We've bought nearly $2 trillion of assets in the open market and expanded our balance sheet. What do we mean we're not doing anything? <laughs> We've taken some of the most extraordinary monetary policy actions ever taken. Uh, we have gone to extraordinary lengths, lengths to try to mitigate and address the nature of the shocks we're we're, we're dealing with. And we still have unemployment at 9%. I think we have to ask ourselves the question at times, okay, is monetary policy the solution to this problem, or is it, is it nature of the shock something different where monetary policy isn't the right medicine? Doctors can make serious mistakes when they diagnose a patient and prescribe drugs. If they misdiagnose the disease and prescribe the wrong drug, they actually can make the patient worse. And so, it's an, it's, so we have to have the diagnosis correct. And I think the diagnosis of our economic ills is more challenging than just sort of simple aggregate demand and supply curves and, and stimulating aggregate demand. I think they're more deep-seated than that. I think they involve deleveraging. They involve balance sheets. They involve uh, long-term unemployed. They involve uh, training problems, housing problems. Um, and I think that they are very complex problems, and um, so I think we have to be very cautious in taking, taking um, uh, the empirical evidence to date is asking ourselves some very tough questions if we got the, are, are we using the right tools? So I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. I am um, I, I, I am, I am extremely flattered by, uh, by this award and and, and flattered that so many of you would turn out to listen to some nerdy economist talk about monetary policy. But, uh, but I appreciate your patience and thank you for coming. Charles, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you all for coming. This concludes uh, the formal program. We do have a, a press only uh, part of this program at 2.15, so I want you all to chit chat with each other, but try to be out of the room by 2.15 so you have 15 minutes to network in here and then take it out in the hall. Thank you all so much for coming. <laughs>